Hi, good afternoon. I'm, I'm only assuming that because there are no breaks in this session that people are getting up to take breaks and not leaving because I'm talking about materials research. <laughs> so um, I'm uh, the lead for the materials research campaign and, and uh, I'm not sure we mentioned it uh, over this course of the morning, but um, you know, ARL is, is a research laboratory of about 3,000 people, 2,000 of which are government uh, employees, and many of them are scientists and engineers. So it's a very large organization when you think about it, and it covers the whole gamut of, uh, of science and technology, you know, uh, really quite a large portfolio. Um, and so it can be quite daunting, I think, when you, when you go around and you talk to the researchers to really get a sense of you know, what the Army is doing and most importantly, why is the Army interested in particular areas of research, areas of emphasis, uh, research ultimately that leads into uh, long-term military capability. So um, as Dr. Russell said this morning, and I think General Wharton said as well, one of the real opportunities from an open campus point of view is to have an opportunity, if you're in industry and academia, to sit down with, with not only the researchers but the leadership to get an understanding of where the strategy is, what the overall overarching strategy is from a research perspective. Uh, and to have that back and forth and that dialogue so that you have some intuition about what the Army is most interested in to hopefully whet your appetite uh, to get you to start to think about some of the challenging problems that we can collaborate on. So, so that's what this presentation is going to be about mostly, uh, is to give you a little sense of, of where we're going in materials research. It's a broad area. Uh, I'm going to spend time specifically on the materials work that's happening here at uh, the Abertine Proving Ground and just give you a sense of why we're doing what we're doing. So that's what I'll try to do during my time. So. <laughs> You know, think about this. Last year, 2014, uh, the Army came out with its new Army operating concept, uh, which is online and you can read. And, and I encourage all of you to, to take a look at the Army operating concept because it tells you how the leadership, particularly within the Pentagon, but also the Army Training and Doctrine Command, tends to think about the way uh, the Army is going to fight its wars in the future. Uh, and the title of that document is Win in a Complex World. So the Training and Doctrine Command, the leadership there is the com 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 commanding general is General Perkins and uh, Lieutenant General McMaster and a number of other very, very senior Army officers who spent the last you know, 13 years, 14 years in leadership positions in Afghanistan and Iraq and have really you know, develop, developed with the former chief, uh, General Odiano, the new uh, way that the Army is gonna fight based on their experiences and based on the, the gaps that they identified as a function of, of these past wars, these ongoing wars. So from that context, there are many needs that, that have been identified in, in the new Army operating concept. And I've just listed a few of them here. And you, you heard in the two previous talks some hints to, to some of these problems, uh, you know, but one of the biggest ones we're, we're faced with and what we, we predict we'll be faced with in the future is really operating in contested and congested environments where you don't necessarily own the airspace, where you don't necessarily own the electromagnetic spectrum, um, where you're not necessarily facing an insurgency but facing a near peer or peer adversary who may or may not have, as General Wharton alluded to this morning, uh, a technological overmatch, right? So, I, and you hear this thematically, we never want to send our warfighters into a fair fight. We always want to have overmatch, right? So these are the things that we're most concerned about. Another thing we're always concerned about, we have, always have been and we will be in the future, is, is unburdening the soldier, everything from weight to stress to the, the human, cognitive workload problems associated with fighting in high stress, unknown environments. All of these things uh, really come together in, in a concept that we refer to as unburdening the soldier. 
expeditionary maneuver, you know, the army, an army is, is a couple of things, right? It's, it's people, it's lethality, it's protection, it's information science, and it's maneuverability. And the ability to do all those things uh, is what the army of the future really needs to bring together in, in some integrated, holistic sense. And as I mentioned, lighter, more effective protection, as you might expect, and improved lethality effects. So everything on the left side of this chart is really indicative of the, of the core S&T campaigns that the Army Research Laboratory is involved in. And if you think about the underlying technology that goes into uh, all of these areas, uh, materials is, is ubiquitous. And I don't say that because I materials research lead, but it's really true, right? So on the right side, I've, I've listed a few of the technology gaps that we're most uh, heavily vested in. I'll talk a little bit about these. You're gonna hear, hear a bit more from uh, other speakers this afternoon, and if you go all out and about, which really this is what this is all about, is to get you to go have a conversation with the research staff. Uh, you'll get to hear much more detail than, than any one of us could deliver standing here at the podium. So uh, what I won't do, though, is talk about some of the things uh, in our portfolio that resides at the Adelphi Laboratory Center. Uh, we, we will, uh, I'm happy to discuss them, but I think we, we really do want to focus on what's occurring here at Aberdeen uh, for this open campus, open house. So we have activities, as you might expect, again, big place, lots of activity in photonics and electronics um, and uh, energy and power. You'll, you'll hear some about energy and power at the system and, and subsystem level uh, during this uh, event, but we won't talk about the materials aspects of that. But what I would do want to focus on is uh, bio-inspired bio activities, uh, structural materials, high strain rate uh, and ballistic materials, all of which are underpinned by uh, advances in manufacturing science, which is a big thematic uh, um, opportunity, really, for not only our own staff, but for all of you, because uh, uh, if you get to go at, take the tour at Building 4600, you'll get to see what we're thinking about with regard to an expeditionary manufacturing center, which this manufacturing science really underpins everything that we want to do to win in a complex world. You know, from an Army perspective, we are most concerned with size, weight, power, and the cost of our technology. And all of that can be mitigated if you can do manufacturing with a, with a detailed scientific understanding that translates into those reductions as I just described. So, uh, you know, again, we, we talk about key campaign initiatives. The ones that I'll just briefly touch on, these are the major themes, if you will, across uh, the materials research campaign where there's a lot of activity and a lot of research going on. One is energy coupled to matter for response materials. I'll describe that a little bit. Uh, lightweight materials uh, for Army platforms, as you might expect. Um, Materials for soldier and platform power I'm not going to touch on. I will touch on agile expedient, expedient manufacturing to a, a degree. But uh, in energy efficient electronics and photonics and the, and the quantum sciences area, if you're interested in those activities, you can, you can see me offline and I'll, I'll tell you a little, little bit more about that. So uh, you heard Alex Scott say that these were, these were sort of five to 10 year kind of enduring research activities within, within the laboratory. We also have these underpinning activities as well uh, that we call core campaign enablers. Um, Multi-scale research of materials and living material interfaces. And I'll, I'll just touch briefly on that as well. So you know, here's a bit of the why. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is energy coupled to matter for responsive materials. Uh, Alex briefly touched on uh, megacities, the complexity of a megacity with regard to uh, information sciences and the ability to have situation awareness within a megacity. You can translate that to subterranean environments and fighting in complex uh, subterranean environments where there are maybe tunnels where there are unknown threats and complex threats that uh, you just really have to be prepared for. So, so the notion from our perspective is to deal with these much more complicated environments from a materials point of view, what we'd really like to have are a set, a suite of adaptive materials. So can I on command 
change a material's property or its phase or even its configuration. And that's where we'd like to get to. So on the left-hand side, side of this chart, you can see uh, some simulations that uh, under an intense electric field, in this case, you have a material that could perhaps, perhaps catch uh, a ballistic uh, piece of material uh, and uh, with an applied field. And if I reverse that field, it could perhaps uh, throw that material off whatever it was uh, impinging on, right? So you can think of these kinds of uh, techniques that we'd like to get to. So how can I come up with these kinds of adaptive materials that might lead to uh, you know, agile eye protection or some kind of an advance in an exoskeleton or an exosuit, uh, maybe some conformal stealth at the end of the day. Um, all of these things are being thought about. There, there are examples, there's example research that's on, ongoing right now, mostly focused on understanding the coupling effects at the microstructural level so that we can enable activation of smart materials through application of either electric or magnetic fields. Uh, here's a couple of examples, and uh, again, I want to encourage you to go take uh, a once around uh, and uh, talk to the research staff. There are examples, there's more detail on these, on these particular projects out uh, on the floor, but the, the example on the left is, you know, taking a high magnetic field, so in this case a two Tesla magnet where we've got some doped alumina with uh, some rare earth material that it's doped with. And the thought is, can you apply a magnetic field to get the, uh, the grain structure aligned so that you can get coherent, coherent tex texture in? Uh, and so once you have that, can you then develop models to understand how that densification is formed as a function of the magnetic fields that are applied? Uh, if you go to the right of the chart, you'll see an example of electric field assisted flash sintering where we're trying to model the thermal mechanical properties as a function of electric field uh, in a flash sintering environment. And in this particular example, we're looking at metastable materials that can be taken from a bulk to a powder using uh, an application of electric field. And those powders may have some energetic effects associated with them. And again, this is all about understanding the underlying material science associated with these manufacturing processes uh, and how to best uh, optimize these techniques. And a big part of that is characterization, and there's quite a bit of characterization that can be done either in situ or ex situ to understand these particular properties. So if you go to the tour in building 4600, you'll get to see this flash sintering uh, and this characterization uh, uh, equipment as well. So again, I'm just going to touch on these briefly. If you, if you want some detail uh, about the science that's going on, there, there, I really want to encourage you to talk to the research staff. And if you've signed up for the tour, you can really get a, a chance to see these uh, outside of PowerPoint, this PowerPoint. You know, it's, I'm always in, in awe of what, when you see it in real life. You go, wow, that didn't look like a PowerPoint. It's always much better in real life. So um, as I mentioned, another big uh, initiative within the laboratory is lightweight uh, materials for Army platforms. And the why for this is kind of obvious, right? I mean, you know, for, from a win in a complex world uh, environment where you want to have an expeditionary Army, you know, the less weight, the better, right? And there's a couple of examples. So if I want to unburden the soldier, you know, if you think about a fully loaded soldier for a 72-hour mission, you think about what he's carrying today in his rucksack with his food and his batteries and his bullets and his, you know, all of his other accoutrement. It's about 150 pounds, right? So what you'd like to do ultimately is how do you get that same kit down to 30, 30 pounds would be a goal, right? Um, another example might be uh, the Army's uh, platform, new uh, aviation platform is the future vertical lift helicopter. And what uh, the Army would like to see there is being able to have a transport range of what is about 500 miles today out to about 2,500 miles in the future with similar load capacity. And then that other, the only other example I'll highlight is this ability to airdrop very, very large, heavily armored 
or heavily protected platforms. And uh, to do that in, the, in a C-130, for example, you might need a 20-ton vehicle. So a 20-ton vehicle with you know, the same protection uh, for life and limb and same lethality as well. So I think light, light weighting of materials is, is obviously uh, in the sweet spot for any army, light weighting and protection. Uh, and so when we think about this, we think about novel ways to get light weighting. So think about novel fibers, the weaves, the resins associated with that. Um, and what we want to be able to do at the end of the day is a more holistic approach to this. So uh, Major General Wharton talked about uh, the research development engineering centers across the command. Uh, the folks most, most uh, interested in these kinds of platforms are the Aviation Missile Research Development Eng Engineering Center in Huntsville and the Tank and Automotive Research Development Engineering Center in, uh, in Detroit. And so you think about this from a holistic point of view, you have to work the science all the way up through the requirements to understand how you can best get protection, how you can best get, best get lethality, how you can get multifunction all onto a single platform and get it into these kinds of requirements. So one example here, another example here is the ability to put in multifunctional materials. So think about you, uh, putting in energy storage as a function of structure. And how can I take advantage of the, of the natural spaces that occur within a platform to, to have uh, storage capacity for energy? Another innovation uh, is in terms of uh, magnesium alloys, right? So how do you uh, get to ultra hard, uh, ultra strong magnesium alloys? Uh, and one technique that we're exploring here is in long period stacking ordering for strength and toughness, which I'll hit on just a little bit. But again, uh, if you want to really get into the details of this, I encourage you once again to talk to the research staff. And here's just a couple of examples of some of the work that's going on here in terms of top topology optimization. Uh, you can make a trade between stiffness and weight uh, on the left-hand side. You can get uh, either, uh, this. we've got demonstrations of a 42% uh, stiffer structure for the same weight or 48% in this example uh, lighter for the same elastic stiffness. All of this is uh, really being done in a 3D additive manufacturing uh, paradigm. Uh, and then again, the 3D uh, additive manufacturing allows you to think about these novel structures where you might be able to use novel truss concepts with energy storage concepts to reduce the weight and, uh, and such. On the bottom is an example of uh, some simulation work that's being done here. That's a transmission electron microscopy simulation for uh, a magnesium alloy uh, with different, uh, different planes. You can see different, uh, different ordering. Uh, and the thought here is to increase the fault area so that you can get more ductility uh, to increase your tensile strength, again, for hardening, hardening against ballistic effects. And again, to understand all the way down to the atomistic level through the modeling, up through the structure, and into the manufacturing process itself, how to best develop these, these materials from precursor on up. So um, this next one is, is um, you know, conceptual at its very, very essence. We're just really starting to think about this, but how do you do agile expedient manufacturing? Again, if you're gonna win in a complex world and you wanna have an expeditionary army, one of the things that you're most concerned with is the logistics uh, train tail, right? The Marines call that steel beach. You know, you roll in, you dump all, all your stuff on the beach, it looks like a mountain of steel, and as you go in, you just sort of live off of what you dump. The Army's got the same problem, but we've got it in spade. You know, how do you, how do you, how do you have long, long uh, duration uh, expeditionary warfare and not have to continually go back CONUS to the continental United States or anywhere else your spare parts may be uh, if you're going to be engaged in a long duration kind of uh, uh, fight. So the notion here is how do you make your take your ma manufacturing with you to the greatest extent possible, and how do you make it efficient and expedient? 
to go from months to weeks to days to hours for repair of, of uh, platforms, weapons, uh, et cetera. So what we're thinking about, um, just notionally, and uh, Dr. Allender will chide me if I don't say this, but you know, we don't necessarily see a soldier in the fob wearing an, an EEG cap to figure out what uh, part he needs. But you could think about somebody in the, in the field who needs, let's just say, a wrench, right? Uh, and to say, I know what size wrench I need, and I, and I know what I need to use that wrench on. Uh, and then to be able, with some kind of a model-based enterprise, to enter, enter in some specifications for that wrench, and to bring that to a local expedient manufacturing facility, which may be very, very close, where this 3D printing and any other agile or additive manufacturing can be brought to bear to bring uh, material on demand and by design into the battlefield in a, in a materially expedient way. The big issue is how do you deliver parts that have been 3D manufactured that are spec compliant, that people trust, right? So how do you get over that notion of um, trusting whatever is being manufactured to the greatest extent you can to use in a military specific environment? So there is you know, activity underway in many, many aspects of this uh, here at the laboratory. I just want to highlight a couple. There's, again, when you think about agile and expedient manufacturing, and you think about an expeditionary army, you have to guess, you have to predict what kind of precursors you might want to bring forward, depending upon the environment you're in. So flexibility is key. The ability to, uh, to do a, an array of precursor material, everything from polymers to ceramics, understanding the morphology of this material, uh, being able to fabricate uh, precursors and uh, tailor precursors for particular parts. Uh, again, I mentioned underpinning all of this is a detailed analytical study of, uh, of manufacturing science and how one can take advantage of and tailor manufacturing equipment to be flexible uh, across a broad array of precursors, across a broad array of laser wa wavelengths, et cetera. And then finally, I mentioned, uh, again, performance prediction and uh, standards. Uh, you know, we need to get to the point in this kind of a scheme where uh, people are confident that what's being manufactured will be reliable in military systems. Uh, just one example, I think we've already got sort of an existence proof of this, is the, uh, we have done some of this in the field with uh, blade erosion on CH-47s where You've got some, some, uh, some blade erosion. You're able to get the specifications for that. Uh, we were able to bring a cold spray booth out and be able to repair these blades very near their uh, point of use to get them to the point where the user uh, was, a, was uh, confident that uh, what was being done on these blades were, were uh, safe and uh, could accomplish the mission. So, I just want to hit, hit on, uh, again, what really underlies much of the research that, that ARL does in material science is this confluence of manufacturing, uh, hardcore material science, and then high performance computing to do multi-scale modeling uh, across uh, the length and time scales. Everything from, uh, right, you know, fully across the continuum from uh, the atomistic all the way up to, uh, you know, large-scale kinds of system level uh, models. And, the, and the, the key here, excuse me, as was, as was alluded to earlier, is to have some understanding and some confidence in the uh, uncertainty quantification and the validation and verification of these models as you go from scale to scale and to ensure that the, you're not losing anything as you decrease or increase the level of abstraction as you go across these scales. So um, again, a major activity within the organization. On the top, you see an example of the continuum for gallium nitride. 
that has been modeled using HPC assets. And on the bottom, you see an example of uh, uh, battery chemistry for the formation uh, and, and simulation of a solid electrolyte interface, which is critically important for battery uh, storage energy density and uh, for uh, charge recharge cycle times. And then the last one I'll just touch on uh, is uh, microbial enabled expeditionary processing. Again, we're we're talking about uh, this win in a complex world, so becoming more expeditionary, having a, a smaller logistics tail. Part of that uh, includes living off of the indigenous resources to the greatest extent possible. Uh, so one way to think about that is being able to convert waste to energy or waste to biofuels, uh, being able to take advantage of biohybrid materials, um, being able to really understand how biology can impact the soldier uh, for health. And really what we're at, at here is having an undetailed understanding of bioprocesses that, so that we can predict, model, and control biological systems, mostly focused now on understanding the potential uh, of cell membranes and how to, how to understand how cell membranes perform, not only at the beginning of a process, but also at the end of a process. Two more slides and I'm done. Uh, I just want to highlight, again, the materials research facilities. Uh, the Zoll Physical Sciences Lab is at the Adelphi Laboratory Center. Um, if you uh, become an ARL collaborator, I'm sure you'll, you'll make it up there at some point. Uh, here you're going to see we, what we call 4600, that's the Rodman Materials Research Laboratory. Again, if you're going on the tour, that's uh, part of the tour you'll see. Uh, it's been alluded to a couple of times. Uh, we have a number of centers, Center for Research and Extreme Batteries, Specialty Electronics. The one I want to just briefly mention is the center that will be formed here at, at uh, APG, which is the Expeditionary Manufacturing Science Center, the, the core of which you can read there, cold spray, fiber and film, and uh, micro dispense systems. So initially, it will be at uh, the Rodman Center. We'll take advantage of those facilities. Ultimately, if we're successful, we'd like to have it located in a building here on the APG campus. But on the left-hand side, you can see, again, the, the types of processing uh, and equipment that we see uh, involved here. And um, this is a manufacturing science center. So this is not about just taking commercial machines and putting them into a facility and establishing the ability to, to use those machines. This is really about optimizing the performance of those machines with an eye toward understanding and optimizing precursors, with an eye toward understanding and optimizing manufacturing processes so that we can get to agile and expedient manufacturing for the Army of the future. So that's really what that's all about. And uh, I think I'm done. So I'll stop and take any questions if there's time. <laughs>